The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, upon reflection with Al Page. Our guest is Judge Jerome Ferris, U.S. Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit, and Vice President of the Board of Regents at the University of Washington. Are lawsuits about fairness and justice, or are lawsuits about winning? Well, that's a good question, and I suppose they're about all three. The problem with justice is nobody can really define it. You get ten people, and you give them the same fact pattern, and you'll get ten different answers. So that fairness has to enter the equation, and one side wants to win, the other side wants to win. So the only thing either side is concerned about is that they should win, and for that reason, we look at precedent. We, we look to see what, what we've done in similar situations and how this fact pattern varies and try to find a fair and just result. Isn't fairness just as subjective as the notion of justice? Yes, yes, yes. And the only reason I can say fair and just result is that it's fact-driven, I think. I think all cases are fact-driven, and I think many lawyers don't realize that. What do you mean by fact-driven? The peculiar facts of your case should determine what is a fair and just result. Let me try to give you an example. Let's let two people steal a loaf of bread. One liked the smell of the bread and thought, my, I'd like to have that, and took it. The other had five children at home starving and took it. The facts would determine who gets what result. Although they both stole a loaf of bread, they'd both be thieves, on the, as we would look at it, but you'd get two different dispositions, and the disposition would be fact-driven. The facts would determine. But if the facts are specialized to the case, how does precedent help you? Precedent helps in determining the first question. They're both thieves. And then the, what happens as a consequence of the thievery would be determined almost, almost exclusively by the facts. Once you've ruled on a case, how do you know you've made the right decision? Do you ever agonize about that? Never. You can't. You never? Never. I mean, I by, don't I mean that. by never, absolutely never. I, uh, I, I sometimes feel that a case wasn't as well presented as it might have, and the other side could have won had it been better presented. And you regret that the other side didn't present the case better. But you can't agonize over it because you, the calls, I'll tell you, we review on a given day five trials. We review in that week 25 trials. Well, if you agonized, you couldn't be effective. We, we lawyers argue before us, 30 minutes aside, and at the end of an hour, another group of lawyers, another trial. The gong and, sounds. And, and, and they're, they're down, the next group's up. And if you ag you don't have time to agonize. You must move quickly then to the next case. So then after you're home, you, 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 the next day is coming, and you've got to go in here five more. So there's no time to agonize. I truly never agonize over it. But what I do and what I feel I'm required to do, absolutely obligated to do, I read everything I can about a case before I sit, before I hear it. I, I mean by everything. Once when I was younger and I had more time and there were fewer cases, I read every letter in the file. I read everything that was in the file on a case. And so when the lawyers came before me, I was ready to ask them questions. And I needed answers. If they could answer, and the answer was satisfactory, and the other side couldn't challenge it, I knew that my hunches were right. If they couldn't, I, I didn't. But no, I, there's no, truly, there's no time to agonize. So you're telling me a few months after the case is over, you never say, I made a mistake, I wish I could go back and do that one over again. Never, and the never includes the times that I've been reversed. What in your legal training has led you to have that kind of ability? I don't know that it's training. I think it's an awareness of self. On the day that I sit to hear cases, I have obligations to the parties. That obligation is to listen to the lawyers, to know what questions I want to ask so that I can better understand the case, to know precisely what I don't understand, and to get clarification. The lawyers have lived with it. I haven't. I've read what they produce, but it's all cold print. I haven't been in the trial court 
I'm, I'm reviewing a trial, so I must know then what I need to, to have them tell me. And I do, and I ask them the questions, and they have the opportunity to answer. And if they can't, I must call it. My obligation is to resolve a dispute, and I do the very best I can, and when I've done that, that's all God can require. So why can't I require more? I don't require more than that. How much time do you have to make a decision after you hear people? Oh, you have as much time as it takes. There is no fixed time that you must announce a decision. My honest belief is that you should announce a decision as quickly as possible, but as quickly as possible means almost never fewer than 30 days. So you digest what you've heard, you go back and review what you've read already, and you, you, you look for additional precedent to see if it's been treated a different way, and then you write an opinion. And the discipline of writing the opinion causes you to reflect further because you're putting it down now, and it's, it's going to be firm. And you reflect further, and when you finish, it's, it's over. Uh, now, I, and when I said, even when I've been reversed, I haven't been reversed. Fortunately, the Supreme Court's reversed one decision that I've written. And that one, uh, Rehnquist dissented, and so my friends think, well, that just shows you were dead wrong because <laughs> you got Rehnquist dissent and everybody else thought you were. But it's, it's, I, I still think we were right. I, I think we reached the right result. You take the same amount of time for each case. How much time do you decide for each case? The cases will vary markedly. Some cases, you know before you s go out to hear them what the result has to be. There are cases that shouldn't have been brought in the first place. Is it hard to be kind to lawyers when you know that's true? Goodness, no, because you, you, you see, I say to my clerks, once upon a time, a lawyer representing me in a given situation would have gone against all precedent, and that lawyer should have come forward. And if he hadn't, I wouldn't be now sitting on the court. So I listen very carefully, even when my mind is made up that there's absolutely no basis. I listen and consider. You have to, because maybe you're wrong. Maybe all other cases have decided this wrong, and the person can tell you why you need to do it a different way. So I listen. But when the questions are asked and they can't, you don't get the answers, then you know that your hunches were right. And this is a case that shouldn't be brought. You decided quickly, and in those cases, I can write a disposition the same day I heard the argument and have it typed, review it, and be satisfied with it. What kind of cases take a long time? The cases where you're on the cutting edge, let me try to think of one or two there. There are any number of cases that are on the cutting edge of the law and you're making a decision that's going to affect a lot of people and it's going to have to last, you hope, for a long time. And in those cases, you have to ponder. There's not enough to say, here is the way we go. There was a case, I'll give you a quick example. In, in Washington, for a long time, well, we had a statute that if a father of a child, this was when I was on the state court, if a father of a child isn't identified within the first three years, he's free. There's, there's no support obligation. The mother, of course, can't, after three years, go and drop the baby on the step somewhere and say, I'm free. Nobody has obligated me to support this child and to take care of the child, but the father could. Well, the statute was wrong, and somebody said to us in a case, it's discriminatory. It, it favors the male sex. And, you know, you stop a moment and you think about it. The mother can't dump the child, so why should the father? This is, of course, a situation where the father hasn't married and he must be identified, and the question was proof. And the theory was, if in three years you don't prove it, you make the burden too difficult for the father to, to prove otherwise, to refute the proof. But the question is proof, and if you can do it 10 years from now, why shouldn't the child be supported by the father? So we changed the law. We, we, uh, we decided that you're right. We can ignore the statute, and we said so, and at that time, I was on the State Court of Appeals, the State Supreme Court agreed, and uh, we changed it. Well, that case caused you to ponder because the easy route is to say, well, the statute says three years. Three years have passed. You didn't identify him. You're out. In a typical case that takes a long time, is the situation that you go, 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 and then suddenly the light bulb comes on, or do you slowly build towards a solution? 
you must slowly build toward the solution, in my opinion. The other side, in its brief, has said something that has caught your attention. And you, you're going to turn a corner now, in a sharp corner, because, and, and I gave you just the simplest of solutions. I could have given I mean, the simplest of cases because I thought it was easy to understand. There are many complex cases that, that you turn a corner and it's brand new and you've, you've, you've got to decide it and you ponder. A lot of um, technical questions are being presented now. They're old questions, but they're pre being presented in a new situation with a new set of facts, a new kind of consequence. And so even though they are old, in my opinion, they are new. And the lawyers have a heavy obligation, I think, in those cases, to show us why, why we should turn in a different direction, why what we've done always has been wrong. Court cases often turn on expert testimony. What is expert testimony? It's uh, different people that give you a different answer to that, but I think expert testimony is dangerous testimony in, in, a, in the true sense because experts are available for both sides and you have to hope that the expert can be objective in spite of the fact that he's being paid by one side to to take his position but the 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 safety valve is courts can and frequently do disregard all expert testimony they the expert can testify and they can smile and move on so that it, it, it minimizes the danger. But experts should know more about the facts than the average layperson. And they should be able to explain in a sensible and meaningful way why what they say is so. And if they do, they get the attention of the court. When they don't, they lose the attention of the court. One area in which somebody at the University of Washington is, is outstanding has to do with eyewitness testimony. There was a time when courts stopped and listened very carefully. Today, I don't think courts are paying as much attention to experts on eyewitness testimony as they once did. Now, if the expert was here, she'd probably say, wait a minute, Ferris, why do you take my situation? But I think that's so, and I think it's so because it's, it's so difficult to be scientific about what a person sees or doesn't see, what a person remembers or doesn't remember about what he saw or didn't see. What about cases like medical cases where doctors testify? Don't experts have a role there? Yes, and, and I think that's a meaningful role. But the, the difficulty, of course, always is with soft tissue injuries, injuries in which there's no objective proof and the experts disagree, then where are you? And that's, those are the problems. Aren't judges at a disadvantage when they listen to certain experts? Aren't judges the layman in that situation? No, and the, the reason, and I, I understand why you think that, and I understand why the public would think that, but judges are never at a disadvantage, and the reason is we don't have to know. We have to listen, and when we listen, we have to have the ability to hear what has been said and to evaluate it, but we aren't required to have all the answers. We are required to have all the questions, and we should put the questions as well as we can and then listen to the answer. And sometimes listening to the answers requires having additional questions. But when it's over, you're ready to rule. You alluded to this a little bit in the beginning, but tell us once again, in the courtroom, what kind of lawyers drive you crazy? The lawyers who come at the last minute without having prepared their clients' cases. And you can always tell, a judge should never know more about the case than the lawyers before. And when that happens, when you do, when you say to counsel, well, counsel, in the record, thus and so, and you want to then begin a discussion, and counsel won't know that that's in the record. Mm -hmm. And you will say, well, will you review the record and mm -hmm. on, on, on rebuttal be able to answer that question? And you think, my, my, his client is paying a lot of money for something that the client isn't getting. Do lawyers base their core strategies on the known prejudices of judges? They'd be silly if they did. They truly would be silly if they did. There's a lot of argument in the Ninth Circuit that the, the um, Reagan appointees have one philosophy and the Carter appointees have another. There is no judge sitting, in my opinion, who will let his personal philosophy, his personal prejudices, lead him or her to err in a case You've never in order to support 
the personal prejudice. You've you never, go against your prejudices. You've never reviewed a case where you thought the judge was showing prejudice? Oh, I would say yes, I've reviewed cases. But when I say never, I'm talking about judges on appeal. Now, I, I, I don't know about the trial judges. I can say that there are a lot of reasons that you see what you think is prejudice. But it isn't prejudice in the term that the lay person thinks about it. I, I had a client once in the, the uh, whose, whose husband had brought his best friend home, and she had fallen in love with her husband's best friend and told her husband that that's why she was getting a divorce. And I felt that she was entitled to everything she would be entitled to if she had any other reason for the divorce. But the judge didn't think very much of a woman who had fallen in love with her husband's best friend and told him in a way that just, just really hurt the husband in many ways, in every way. And so the judge, in my opinion, was prejudiced against wives who fell in love with their husband's best friends. And I told her that, the judge. Well, she thought, when I said the judge was prejudiced, that he, he had some racial bias against me. And that's why he didn't give her what, she, what I thought she was entitled to. Well, she got far more than many people would have given her. But that was a bias that I don't think the judge, in that case, was able to control. Well, somebody can correct that. It wasn't worth appealing because she came out very well, but uh, sometimes a bias will get in the way, I think, of a trial judge. But upon review, it should be corrected because the person reviewing it, had I taken that case on appeal, I didn't because what she got was perfectly fair. I just wanted more than anybody would sensibly want. But uh, if I had taken it on appeal, I would have been able to point out to an appellate court, I think, without any difficulty, that the reason her her, um, her share was cut down was because the judge was biased against her. Let's completely change the subject. You've served on commissions dealing with delinquency and crime. Do we have any feeling, any judgment as to why young people get involved with crime? It's the most complex question you could ever ask. And the thing that makes it more complex, in my opinion, is because people want a simple answer to a very complex question. I had a father once whose son needed him, needed more from him, but he didn't need more of his money. And we were discussing how the son needed more from the father. And I was discussing this with the father. This was a time when I was a social worker before I was practicing law. And the father thought, well, why don't I build him a, a drag strip? He likes to race cars. I've got some property. Why don't I build him a drag strip? And I tried to get to what the son needed from him. And he thought, well, maybe, maybe he just needs a better car. Maybe I should just buy him a... And he, it, it, was, it was impossible to convey what I needed to convey, that the child needed the father. And what he needed was not the father's money. He needed the father's time, the father's interest in, in the problems that he was having, the father's concern. And that's what he was going to get. And so he was going to continue to behave in a delinquent way. Well, you say, okay, that's true in every case. Not at all. There are cases where the father does precisely the same thing this father did, and uh, he has no result at all. The, the child works out very well. Human beings are as different as fingerprints, and nobody wants to believe that. Almost every human being deals with almost every other human being in by categorizing. There are people who have a way that they respond to Jews, as a way that you respond to Chinese, as a way, and the spectrum, if you could line individuals up, would be so mixed. You know, there wouldn't be all the Jews and then all the blacks and then all the whites. It would be so mixed because we're all individuals and it's, it's a very complex thing. I think that if children have self-esteem, and if parents somehow instill self-esteem, and if children feel that their parents are concerned about their welfare, uh, delinquents would be minimized considerably. But with the continued breakdown of the family in society, doesn't that imply that problems associated with juveniles will never be solved? No, because unfortunately, for the sociologists who believe that everything is, has to do with a broken home, it may or may not have anything to do with it. It may strengthen some children. 
Some children come out of those terrible situations ready to move. They have every fine quality that anybody wants to see, and some are just destroyed by it. It varies. The individual response will vary to any given situation. And you know it when you look at brothers. You take, um, and I don't think it's in his secret here, so there's nothing wrong with it, but Johnson was president of the United States and his brother had a very serious problem with alcohol. Now, I'll stop it there because I don't know his brother and his brother's record isn't as, as well known as, as the president's. And yet they had a lot of things in common, I suppose, because they came out of a common background, but one was able to succeed in the world in a, in a remarkable way while the other was an absolute failure depending upon your measuring rod. You sound like you're implicitly making an argument for flexible sentencing when dealing with juveniles who are in trouble with the law. Oh, yes. In fact, there ought to be flexible sentencing across the board. One of the silliest things our Congress ever did, and they think they are right even today, was try to get uniform sentencing. There's a bill now that's causing all manner of difficulty in courts because judges are required to sentence uniformly. And that rules out the thing we talked about earlier when they said the woman who stole a loaf of bread because she's got hungry. You give them the same sentence, according to our wise Congress. And that isn't going to work in time. The Congress will realize how wrong it is and repeat it, as they've done a lot of times with other things. I don't know how soon, but it'll have to happen. It's clogging the courts. But the counterargument is, why should individual judges play God when you're saying this is a very complex issue? He can't can't play God, but he can do this. He's on the scene. He's there. He can listen to the lawyers. He can get the facts. He can know the case, and he can do the best he can for this position. And if he's wrong, our system can correct that. They're, they're built-in correctors. They were in the old system. It, it began to break down because of a number of factors, but there were correctors in the old system. You had a parole board, and the parole board said, you're not going to serve it all or you are going to serve every minute of it. And there were, there were ways to correct the judge's errors, so we didn't have to be God. Are criminals currently going through the justice system like revolving doors? That, I think, unfortunately, is going to always be the case. I yes. wish we corrected in our system, but I don't think we do. Ex I think that'll always be the case. Ex explain. The, there is a separate culture inside of prisons and there are some people who work very well in that separate and strange culture. And they are going back to it because they know how to manipulate it. They, they, they thrive there. They are somebody in that setting and they're nobody out in society because they, they can't function well. So they're going back and they'll commit a crime to go back. The other thing is there is no way yet devised to rehabilitate a person who has criminal tendencies. I suppose there could be a way, but society won't sit still for it. And so what we do is penalize. And the, the setting is always a setting where a person is going to be penalized, except, of course, for the country club type uh, facilities that I don't know about, but I've heard about that we've got where you got it. But in the other settings, it's, it's, it's punitive. And People need more than punishing, and society isn't going to spend the dollars that are required to rehabilitate. If you had the power to change the justice system for criminals, what changes would you make? I'd first let them work. They do meaningful work. That's the first thing I'd do. It's done in almost all countries except our own, and it has something to do with unions and with labor and with, and I don't want to, I don't know enough about it to be, uh, to give you all of the reasons, but I can tell you that they do no meaningful work. They acquire no new skills. And you should, it seems to me, have a system that would enable them to do productive work and to acquire skills that they can use on the marketplace. So when they're released, what can they do? Well, if they're good thieves, they can go back and do some more stealing because they haven't learned any new skill. And they've got to survive. In their opinion, the only way to survive is to do what they've been doing. So I think you teach them new skills, and you can do that in a prison. Let's change the subject once again. How did your grandmother influence you? Oh, my. I don't know how you knew that, but my grandmother was a great influence in my life. My grandmother was... My grandmother believed in the right. 
She dealt only in absolutes. She thought that anything other than absolute honesty was not honesty. There was no middle ground for my grandmother. My grandmother, my grandmother was the most remarkable person in the world. She thought, for instance, that you kneel to pray. And in a Baptist church where everybody stood, my grandmother spread a handkerchief and knelt to pray because that's the attitude. You pray on your knees. And the remarkable thing about her was that it embarrassed me and she somehow must have known it because she never said to me, Jerome, kneel. You kneel to pray. I could stand, standing next to her. And I thought about it and she was dead before I realized how significant that was. She followed a straight path and, it, and she did it without Somebody came to sell insurance when I was a little boy and she listened to a story and she said to him, my grandbaby can't sell your grandmother insurance. It's a white salesperson and I'm not going to buy yours. It uh, sounds like a good package, but I'm not going to buy it. She never shopped in a supermarket. Never. Jerome, we must help each other. That was what she believed. and. So we shopped for one day, my sister and I thought, grandmother's spending all this money. We know where we can get it cheaper. Let's do it. And she sent us back with a bag of groceries. You must go to the neighborhood store and, and pay the higher prices. And she was a very poor woman. But we must help each other. She said, How can she not influence me? My goodness, I think about it all the time. Judge Jerome Ferris, U.S. Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit, and Vice President, Board of Regents at the University of Washington upon reflection. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.